Yasser, a few days ago you messaged me saying you'd like to do an interview. What do you want to tell the fans? That's right, Habibi. I, I called you and we spoke on the phone at length and I basically mentioned that I'll be retiring from the international scene and also from professional football. Um, I've got a couple of things in the pipeline and I've built my own football club. I've got a couple of business ventures and I want to really go into football coaching. And I think it's time, man. And that's why we're here. That must have been a very difficult decision for you to make. Super difficult, super difficult. But also, uh, it's quite calming because for me, it was only a few people that I could ever play for and I've really ever enjoyed playing for. I mean, clubs or managers. And it hasn't transpired that I can play for them anymore this season. I haven't had a, pre a, a proper pre-season anywhere for the first time in a long time. But I've also, you know, weirdly enjoyed the fact that I've got time to focus on the things that will build my life for the next five to ten years. I don't think football will, will do that for the next ten years, Play, especially playing for the international team. And so, you know, it's kind of calming and reassuring that my mind is now focused and has, um, or I have a purpose to go after the, the things that I want for the next five to ten years. So you talk about now you're, you're in the process of starting your own club. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, I built up a club from scratch. I was sitting down with my longtime friend of over 20 years. He's been in football coaching and we both decided let's uh, build a football club. And then we went ahead and got sponsorship uh, and agreements in place. And so the football club is named after a company called KickX that's gonna, going to bring indoor football arenas to, to the UK. And yeah, we've signed everything. We've got a team going and our first game is next week. And I will be playing for them. So from that sense, I will be playing non-professionally, not in the leagues anymore, but I'll be playing for them, captaining them and also being an owner. Will you be involved in the coaching and managerial side of things here or? I try to leave the coaching to the, to the manager, but I'm almost like as if I'm an assistant coach uh, and I love it. I really do. We're working with a really young squad, new players, different backgrounds, different areas of living in the country. And I've actually really loved teaching the basics of football. And that, and I guess that's why I'm a little bit calm on my decision to, to leave the professional game because uh, it's, it's been so rewarding. So I know if I could potentially get a job uh, in coaching youngsters, um, that would be very rewarding and uh, I'd love that too. Yeah, so a few years ago, me and you were sat uh, and we were talking about your ambitions to coach in Iraq and start your own football club there. Mm -hmm. Soon after that, you went to Erbil and then you returned at one point to Zaho. Mm -hmm. How comes this like ambition didn't materialize? I got start I have to start off by saying that going back to my country uh, was overall very positive because my language became a little bit better. Even though it's not as good as my English, uh, hence why I like to speak in English, my language became a lot better and I could understand my culture a lot more. Because I grew up in Britain uh, to, um, Iraq, to Iraqi parents. I didn't understand my culture so much. Even though I went back with the international team, we were always traveling everywhere. Thailand, Australia, Vietnam. I never really spent enough time in Iraq. And over the past two years, I've actually spent enough time in Iraq to understand my culture and the system in play there. And so my dream was to play in Iraq, get back into the national team and build an academy and potentially build a football club. But the way the system works over there, you could spend a year or two building something and it could vanish in one day. There's quite a bit of turmoil 
and I saw that there are some people, well, not some people, there's actually a lot of people that are no good in powerful positions. And the good people are not necessarily hiding, but they just want to live a peaceful life. Uh, and, that's a, and that's a difficult position to be in because when you're trying to do some good, you're basically surrounded by a lot of bad people. And so um, I thought I'd just come back here and realise my dream in, in, in London, in England. Are you saying that when you were in Arab, there were people like actively um, trying to jeopardise what you were working on? Or you just found it difficult as a climate to actually work there? No, I think I th it's not active. Yeah, yes, in a sense, it is actively, but they're just there's no morals anymore, and it's very unfortunate. I I live my life in a certain way where I built principles over years through experience, and um, and these principles are are what guides me, and I don't see anybody in Iraq who's. I don't see many people who have good principles. The good ones are just trying to live a peaceful life. That's an issue because it's difficult to have a peaceful life in a country that's in a bit of turmoil. So what happens is, is the people without principles get the positions of power, which means do they really want anything good for the country? Do they really want Yasser creating an academy and making players and then potentially building them up and um, taking them to Europe? What benefit is that to them? When you were in Iraq, mm. you obviously you moved from London and the UK where football is at the highest level across the world. Mm -hmm. Then now you're in Iraq. Talk me through those experiences in terms of what you made of playing there, the quality of the players, the whole experience in general. Again, I really, really enjoyed the cultural aspect and understanding myself a little bit more. I really, really did grow up. <laughs> but the footballing aspect, it's, uh, it's unprofessional. So from the top down to the bottom, it's very unprofessional. And what would the reason be for that other than ego? They don't care. There's a lot of people in club football over there that don't care. They work on a day-to-day -day, um, plan. Maybe even an hour-to-hour -hour plan. What's for lunch? And let's do something after lunch. Maybe we'll do a second session. It's They don't have a long-term vision and a long-term plan. Now, whether that's the system or not, Maybe so, hence why people don't have long-term vision and a long-term plan because they don't know what's coming tomorrow. But nonetheless, it's not how a society should work and it's not really how a, a human being should work. You need to have something in place long-term because, you know, yeah, anything can happen by tomorrow. But what happens a year down the line if you haven't set things up properly? Um, so you've got people again in powerful positions in football and there's no plan from the top to the bottom and the top guides the bottom and the bottom are the players and if the top is a mess then the players just inherently become a mess as well from a like particular footballing experience yeah. what was the quality like there i i can't say i can't compare it to any other second or third division in Europe. There's one or two good teams on their day and some good players, but it's just an unprofessional setup. So you're not gonna you're not gonna see any players come out of that league and go off to Europe or go off abroad and, and do really well because again the top is a mess. Therefore, the actual league and the way it's set up and the way the football is being played over there, it's a mess. It's a mess. The thing is, we've talked about there being good players in Iraq and you've acknowledged that there are some very good talents there, but the system doesn't allow them to flourish. Okay. So what can we do 
to help these players fulfill their potential, if anything? I think at this point in my career, I would have said something different when I was younger because I wanted to change the world. <laughs> so even change the football culture back at home and in the international scene and even certain clubs where I was based here. But now what I would say is you need to just look after them to the point where they can survive. I don't think those players would thrive because the majority have such low energy that those guys that really want to do well, they get dragged into that negative sphere. And it takes a really, really strong person to just persevere, persevere and persevere. And even a strong person is not necessarily going to thrive in that environment, but he'll survive it. And I think if they can survive it and somehow with a little bit of luck and a little bit of, and the luck is basically guidance, good people around them, they can maybe make it out. But it's a very small, small percentage. And, and again, you've got to be lucky. Let's take things back about seven years ago when you were first called up to play for Arab. Mm -hmm. What did that moment mean to you when you found out you were going to be selected? It was a great moment. I've always wanted to play for my country and some of my best moments in football have been playing for my country. So what I know now well, since I've had the experience of playing for the international team, I've realised that it's going to probably be one of the most, or, or the biggest impact on my life, playing for my, for my country, because I've grown so much through it, and I've seen so much in that sort of sphere, is that I probably, if I go back and relive my debut, knowing what I know now, I'd... I'd love it even more because it was probably it was the day that you know I went back home and I've slowly unraveled my upbringing and understanding of where I'm from. What would you say has been the biggest lesson you've learned about um, Arab during the last ten years or seven years or whatever? As in the football and culture or the and life lessons in general? The life lessons. What I've learned is that Iraq, uh, in, at its core, has probably the most beautiful um, mannerisms or, how do I say, just giving. They're very giving people, the good people, they're very giving. You know, I've been to Iraq, I've been to friends' houses. I can go in there and literally go to the kitchen and just make a plate of food and there's always food and I can always sit down with the family any time of the day. You don't see that in many different cultures. And that's what I, I've i learned from, from that culture, uh, how, how beautiful that can be. And I really, really appreciate that because that's, that's our loving culture. So Yasser, you've talked about Arak. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences and time with the Araqi fans? Love them. They love me. I'm sure they still love me, even though I'm not playing anymore. Um, yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. They gave me something that, again, through experience, now I understand. Uh, they didn't, even though I, they know me through football, I always felt that sort of connection whenever I met the fans, that there was genuine love. And it's always nice to be loved. So that sort of feeling coming from a place where I left from a young age and not knowing my sort of cultural upbringing, it kind of helped me develop 
what I think is a good heart. And so they were a big part of my development as a person. And so I really appreciate them. Appreciate the common man. I appreciate them. Just the people coming up to me in the street or the restaurants or whenever we uh, were at the hotels. They're just really nice people and they were really, really nice to me. Now that you've officially retired, what would you say is your favourite footballing memory in general? And then what's your ever favourite memory playing for Arab? Obviously, my debut was a great memory for Iraq, so I always had to go with that. But it was more just a collection of everything, of every of everything, you know. I was a young man when I went with the national team, and I've come out as a as an actual man. So, just that progress of of myself has been amazing. I've uh, and I've travelled the world. Um, and football, generally, every single day, I love, I love football. So every single day was, was a highlight for me. You know, some days weren't the same as other days, some lows, some highs. But I truly, truly loved everything about it. You don't have any regrets? No regrets, but I just wish we we could have. I wish I could have. Uh, I could have won more. I wish I could have done. I, I wish I could have changed that world. I just couldn't. I couldn't do it. I know why I couldn't do it. You need the right people in the right places, and the right system to flourish. But I wish I could have done it. I think it was virtually impossible, but I wish I could have done it so I can look back and go, you know what, I did sacrifice everything and give all my time so that I could uh, succeed with the national team. And also in football, football. How close were you to playing for the uh, Premier League team at one point? Yeah, very close, very close. And when, when you look back at that, do you feel like anger, resentment, or do you just accept it as uh, something that just happened? No, it's the footballing world and it's the business. So in business, you can't really look at things back and, you know, get angry because, again, they're not in your control. You can only be angry at something that was in your control and you didn't do it. Hey, all you need to do is get the paperwork done get an agreement in place and it'll all and it'll all happen but businesses don't work like that they have budgets they have thoughts they change their mind so however something i always say it can be as close as you want it to be but if it's not signed and sealed it's never done so yeah unfortunately i haven't i didn't get that chance to make that move but that's that's business so you played for swindon you managed to play at Wembley the first time i lock to do so mm. Then you were very close to signing for Swansea. Mm -hmm. From there onwards, do you feel like maybe you, you dipped in form and you never really recovered? Or how do you see your career onwards from there? Onwards from there, I started accelerating in maturity and understanding the football aspect and the business side of the football ring world. And I realised that Maybe around that time, I should have gone a bit earlier abroad because of my style of football. The issue is, even abroad, their structure is not necessarily great in Europe. Football, in its essence, is a team sport, an individual business. And so sometimes you have to make business decisions that I'm, what I'm trying to say is you've got to sign basically contracts so that you can look after yourself long term that are not necessarily good for your football and that, that's one of the issues because um, it's a business you know you still need to sign a deal to play for a club and if you were told a certain thing hey come here we're going to build a team around you and then suddenly they don't build a team around you 
and the manager gets sacked after a couple of weeks. You know, you might spend six months out of the game, not necessarily playing. You're signed to the club, but you're not playing. Are and you saying this happened to you? Oh yeah, that happened to me. Oh, which and it's ha that happened at Northampton. Yeah, four weeks in, the manager that brought me got sacked. I obviously had to get out of the deal. And then at that time, when you're, you've got business interests on the outside and I'm maturing as a person and I'm trying to invest, it's, it's business. So when business meets sport, football, your football suffers. And from the outside then, people look and go, oh, yes, he's not playing. Oh, but nobody really knows the truth and what's happening. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's what they want. They want you to play. If, if people do love you, uh, they always want the best for you. They want you to play. But life, life doesn't work out like that. Sometimes you have to take a few of the punches and then move, move forward. And that's what happened. So at uh, Northampton, you don't really get much game time. You had a new manager come in and maybe they, did it. they preferred other players over you. Yeah. What happened after that? Traveled the world again. I went off to Sweden for a little bit and saw how the structure was abroad and realized, you know, it's not that too different. And even the playing style is not that too different. You, football is a young man's sport, but you need the maturity of, you know, almost a middle-aged person and so again you you need the right people around you so they know what's going on but i had to learn that first hand our first hand experience and so i spent time in sweden uh, and after sweden i went i went to iraq When you were in Sweden, how good was the Swedish league com coming from the UK? It's good. It's good. I mean, it's not a bad league. The issue is the clubs or the cities that are bigger have a bit more of the power um, financially. So what they do is they tend to get the bigger names. And so from top to bottom, there's really no comparison. There's only two, three teams, and then the rest are fighting for mid, mid table. So as a league and as a product, it's not the best out there, but the footballing was pretty good. Um, obviously didn't like the cold, yeah. but it is what it is in Sweden. Um, yeah. But I enjoyed my time there. The thing is, there are some fans at home in Iraq who maybe look down upon the Swedish league or mm. maybe say, oh, it's not that much better than the Al-Aqa league. You're somebody who's played in both. What would you say to uh, these fans? I don't think they're fans. I just think that's misinformation. What are they comparing the Swedish league to when they say the Swedish league is not very good? It's the Al-Aqa league. They're saying yeah, that. so that's just misinformation because they know the Al-Aqa league is not very good. So the, that... If they're saying that, they know that they're lying because they've either not gone to Sweden or the UK or other European countries and seen it, or they're, li they're lying. So one, it, it both, it, both roads lead down to lying because if you haven't seen it, you can't say that. And if you have, you're lying. So it's just misinformation. I played in the Iraqi league. I've been around Iraqi players. Yeah. It's not a professional setup. It upsets me when people, it doesn't upset me when people say that. It upsets me when people are lying because you're seeing it right in front of you. You're seeing it right and it affects a lot of youngsters. When you're telling them, oh, the league is good, the league is good. They'll go in thinking the league is good. And the first game of the, of the season is abandoned. Or the second game is every 10 minutes, a fan jumps on and stops the game. Every 15 minutes, someone falls down and pretends he's injured. 
that's not a professional league. So I, 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 I would not even listen to people that say things like that. Just to play devil's advocate, right? Some, some of these fans might argue, oh, we have these players coming from Sweden, these expats, they come to the Alaka national team and they all fail. So clearly, these mm -hmm. players that are doing well in the Swedish league, the, the Swedish league must not be as good as uh, people are telling us. And well, the Alaka players are doing better for the national team. How do you answer this? Well, you have to deconstruct how the national team is set up. Yeah. At the root of it all is money. So the national team, the way it's set up, is to make players and sell them on. So if a player from the Iraqi league does well and he gets sold to a Middle Eastern club, he's not getting all his whole deal. The, that whole contract is not coming to him. A lot of it is going to other people. And those people are in and around the national team. So when a player like me comes from abroad and plays for the national team, whether I do well or not, in fact, if I do well, they're not going to get any money from me. My contract signs are in Europe. So my agents are in Europe. Even if I go to a Middle Eastern club and sign there for big money in Qatar, Dubai, none of the people in and around the national team get to see any part of that money. Whereas the Iraqi players, yeah. when they get sold on, a big chunk of that money goes to people that help them along the way. And help them in what way? Probably giving them chances that they shouldn't deserve. Because no player should be played unless the manager wants him to play. And it's usually the teams that do the best or the, or the most competitive. The best players who train and play well tend to start the games. So that's not the case with the, the Iraqi team. So what happens is, if you're not feeding that system financially when you come from Sweden or you come from America or anywhere, then why would they help you out? Why would they, why would they try to push you on and do well? They'll actually put obstacles in your, play, in your, in your, in your way. Yeah, so this is a big acquisition that you're making here. Have you seen this first time in front of you? I know it, I know it. It's not I've seen it, I know it. It's how the system works. It's how they how do you think they, they're gonna they're gonna live? How does how, how what why isn't the national team having a sponsor? Or why don't they have a long term vision or a long term pl plan? Can you argue that it's just, in terms of strategic planning, it's very poor, not necessarily just as a matter of corruption? I don't think they want to strategize or, or plan. That's the issue, because if you strategize and plan, you've got to make documents, you've got to do the right things, left, right, and center. You've got to bring this play in. You've got to have contracts in place where, you know, if you qualify for a World Cup, you know what you're getting. It's not let's just have a meeting and you're getting this amount or that amount or no amount. It's actually, it's done like a European countries. You know, European countries sign their international teams, sign with their, their respective FAs every two years, if I'm correct. Because every two years, there's a tournament. The European Championship or the World Cup. They come around every four years, but every two years, they, they, they technically are played. And so they have contracts in place. If you play X amount of games, if you win this tournament, you get this. There's a bonus structure for the, for the management, bonus structure for the players. That, that's not there to be seen in, in Iraq. So what does that mean? It means everybody's trying to get something or piece of the pie. And the biggest piece of the pie is really players. You play players and you sell them on. Because they, I haven't seen them have a good sponsorship deals. I haven't seen them build. They've built stadiums, but they've you know they've let some stadiums rot. I haven't seen a system. They haven't built the league. The league in itself is a product. You want people around the world to watch your league. They haven't built that product. So what do they have? They have players. 
Let's make some players, let's sell them on, and let's make some money. So, Yasser, you were in Ara playing. What did you find was the hardest thing to put up with? What were the biggest challenges there? Planning. Really planning. That was the biggest challenge because you didn't know what was happening Friday morning or Saturday morning. And you have a game Saturday afternoon. So, you didn't know exactly what was happening. So there wasn't very much planning and also the issue with um, team morale because payments aren't made on time, if at all. There's miscommunication or no communication at all on purpose between said president, directors and players and staff, especially the foreign ones, don't understand what's going on because they're not used to this sort of set up so yeah planning it's really at the end of the day it's not planning it's the way the system is being built they don't want to plan because again they'll be held accountable for their actions nobody really wants to be held accountable for their actions because if you are held accountable it means you become a better person you become a better worker and you work and you help others you know i can hold you accountable you can hold me accountable and that's how you really build a, a, a winning culture. They don't really want that. They don't want to be held accountable, unfortunately. What about with the national team? Like, what were those experiences like? Well, you can't really hold anybody. Okay, we have something in our culture that I, I think is great and very bad. You have to respect your elders at all times. I think it's a beautiful thing when you respect your elder when they, you know, getting old. <laughs> they're getting old. They don't have the same... They have certain physical limits. You know, they, they're graying. You know, all our parents get old, our grandparents. And you want to love them and care for them because they're, they're older than you. And they've been through so much in life and... They've lived a long time, but it's that generation where they're just a little bit older than the players and you can't hold them accountable. You still have to show them respect and, and you can't hold them accountable because you have to show this sort of fake almost respect because they're older than you. Yeah, okay, you're older than me, but we still need to get things done. We still need to make sure that training is on time. We still need to make sure that training is done well. We still need to make sure that things aren't being done outside in the hotels and, and things like that, that just so that you can show you're respected. So little things, they'll come to your room at night, stuff like that, to check in on you and stuff like that. Think, oh, hey, we'll take away your mobile. Yeah, all this is not a problem. Taking away your mobile, coming in to check. But if the way is done, certain people do that to show, oh, I'm a little above you. And so that stops from, stops players becoming men and stops them from holding people accountable. And that's one of the biggest problems in, the, in that culture. Hey, you're not doing your job. If you're not doing your job, I can't do my job to the best of my ability. So where are we going to go from here? Exactly. In that culture, where it goes is the younger play the players just shut up and put up. Were there any issues between you and Yunus Mahmoud? Well, there was a point that was all over the news when you were with the national team, um, some videos that were leaked and all sorts of nonsense and drama. What actually happened? I have I've had no issues with Yunus. Yunus is Eunice um, I've had no issues with him I think it's uh, things are really um, if there is a problem which there obviously is because we don't succeed as a as a footballing country the problem is is the system so I've got no issues with Eunice and I know he's done he's done good things on the pitch for the for the team obviously helped Iraq win the Asia Cup which is a massive achievement. So you keep talking about the system, the system, the system. 
can you make the argument that the people in the FA are not to be blamed because the whole country mm. seems to be in turmoil? Or do you think that's just yeah, but exonerating we, them? But at what point do you ask people to be men about things? What's a man? You need to be a good person. You need to build something for future generations. At what point do you go, okay, it's only the system. I do talk about the system. And if you're an individual and you're trying to do some good, it's very, very difficult. But at what point do we sit down and go, okay, well, none of you are doing anything good. <laughs> so what do we do? Remove them all? Or? No, you don't remove them all. If you want a real, if you want a real solution, I think it just comes back to culture. It comes back to power. The people who who have power need to be good people, and the culture. Go back to to the culture of respecting your elder. Okay, I respect you. Are you being held accountable? Are you doing your job? If you're not doing your job and you're being egotistical and dangling this sort of respect above above a younger person, that younger person is going to be scared. Which means what? Which means you're not a good individual because that's not how you lead. You don't lead through fear. You've got to lead through direction through being a strong person, through using your power in the right way. Setting an example. Setting an example, that's right. Every action, all your actions are made so that they are to the success of the people around you and the environment that you're in. At what point are you going to sit down and go, well, your actions are not being like that? At what point? Well, we, we can talk about the system, we can go about the individuals, but people need to just... They need to do the right thing, man. That's the problem. Um, I'm going to go slightly off track here yeah. with this question, Yasser. What would you like Halaki fans to know about the difficulties and the challenges that you and other young footballers in the UK, Halaki and Halaki, yeah. that they go through? Like some, I don't think many people really appreciate what it means to be a footballer. What would you like people to understand about the challenges involved in a sport? I think the biggest challenge is the mental side. So you grow up in a different environment to Iraq, so you don't understand that culture. And so when you go there, you have this sort of culture shock. And then you try to change it, you try to get the football and culture, the way it's done in Europe, and it doesn't quite get there. And in the in between all that, you're growing up as a footballer, and you're maturing, and you're in, and you don't you can't you you're not quite getting it right, and it feels like you're a little bit alone in that, or just one or two other players are with you. It's a very difficult period. Of, uh, of, a, of a man's footballing journey. On top of that, you're traveling. A lot of traveling. You're playing. Injuries. Life happens. Relatives passing away. Um, maybe you've got a business investment that's gone wrong. Uh, pandemic. You know, those sort of things that they... That, th that just crop up out of nowhere and you're still trying to fight for what's right you're still trying to make sure that you do the best in training you still try to do be the best in the hotels eat well sleep well it's a it's a lot it's a lot people say it's a sacrifice you're literally sacrificing your life for this one thing and it's football I don't see it as a sacrifice, but what I do see it as is a loss of innocence at a young, early age. Because in normal life, kids don't lose their innocence so early because they go through this sort of structured program of schooling, college, university, then apprenticeship, and then job. It doesn't work like that with football. You could be 19 years of age and playing in front of 60,000 people. You kind of have to be... <laughs> I have to have a certain mindset that's different to to be in that in in that sort of cauldron of fire as they say. So 
So when you keep talking about the differences in culture between UK or European based football and then going to Iraq, mm -hmm. when you went back to Iraq, what was the biggest cultural shock? What were the biggest elements that really stood out to you that you found maybe strange or difficult to adapt to? This is the number one is you having respect for your elders and who are not doing a good job. That's the number one. Uh, number two, uh, which is a positive, it's not really a culture shock, it's just the kindness, the kindness of the good people. Yeah. Genuine kindness. It's not a kindness of, oh, this is what our culture is about giving. It's a genuine kindness. I would eat alone in a restaurant and I go have to pay and they won't allow me to pay. It's, it's not even about that amount, it's not that much, but they won't take my money. And I'm like, guys, just take my money. So I try, I try to leave a tip for, for the waiter or, or that waitress. It, they have, we have a kindness that's not, that's not attached to anything, but being a nice, it's just being nice. So when that ha genuinely happens, I was, uh, I, I took that on board and found that to be a beautiful thing. And I try to do that in, in my life. I try to be like that as well so that it wasn't a culture shock but it did get come back to me because i've seen it growing up with my with my environment even though in the uk but it's over there i i, I managed i managed to see that head on so i i love that what about in terms of football what were the biggest cultural shocks in terms of style of play or like um quality of football and how did you adapt to that yeah, it's, it's it's very how they say in in England. It's off the cuff. It's just made up on the go. There's one or two managers, as well as two footballing minds that know how to do things. Thank you. Well, well, I think at a certain point Ravi was very good at that. Um, at the same time, he's building. He's trying to build. I think Ra Ravi, from an Iraqi manager point of view, but it's usually the foreign coaches that have that sort of mindset, hey, we need to do this and do that. Um, so, unfortunately, what happens, uh, what happens is they come up against uh, different forces in the background that stops them from from making sure that their plan works. So, we could do a tactical session and have a team and then some calls are made and the team changes that's a big problem and you saw this happen in front of you well i didn't see it happen in front of me but i know of it i know of it what it's just happened? weird it's just weird decisions being made left right and center why is this guy playing why is that it, it's not even weird it's just it, sometimes it's so egotistical i think it's sometimes just to disbalance the situation because at the end of the day, what is success? Success is winning a tournament. Can we win a tournament and sell a bunch of players from Iraq and make a bunch of money on their contracts? That's what the guys at the top are thinking. Can you do that? Great. But if we can't do that, can we just sell a bunch of players, play them a few times and move them to another club uh, in the Middle East and make money? Then we'll go for that. Because actually winning a tournament, we can do that, but it takes strategy, it takes planning, it takes a manager having four year contract. Hey, from day one, he's doing X, Y, and Z. Nobody coming into the office and saying, hey, what about this player that, he knows each player. Um, you talked about foreign coaches being yeah. good then. Uh, who, who stood out to you? From the foreign coaches? Yeah. I This is the issue with the foreign coaches though. They generally they are good, but they didn't stand out too much because they weren't given the ability to to manage. So generally, I'm when I talk about foreign coaches, are the coaches that I've seen, in and around Europe, and also with the national team to a certain degree. But it's a different atmosphere over there. There's no planning, so they it's almost they they fighting a losing battle. They shouldn't even be fighting a battle. It's your national team. It's your con this country has put a manager in place. Let him build. 
and so yeah there's obstacles in that place so yeah when uh you left the um the Arafa league you went for kind of like a period where you weren't really playing with the clubs you, mm. uh, you went to the national team and then suddenly uh, you're playing at Zaha yeah and you get a call up after a long absence yeah how was that experience and how was for example playing for Petrovic well I got to the point where I realized I'm not going to get any younger mm. <laughs> so I really want to achieve what I can with the national team and the uh, and the club team because I think we had uh, some good players at Zaha. I quickly realised again, it's not going to quite work out. At Zaha? No, I, I football in general um, in that sort of environment, you know, and so hence why I'm here, I'm stepping away for good. Yeah, it's not going to quite work out. I can't change that world. And I saw a l certain things that shouldn't be seen in and outside football. And I saw some evil and I saw some bad. I also saw some good. But I realized if I can't change that world, what I can do is I can construct my own world. And unfortunately for me, I don't want to be around people that are not good people that are not striving for better because I'm constructing this new world and to do that I like to have good people full, full of love, drive, ambition and that's not going to happen back in Iraq so it's not going to happen with the national team which is unfortunate but that's the reality of it. You've spent a lot of time now in the Iraqi league, in the Iraqi national team, two different spells What's it going to take for Iraq to actually succeed? Like, what do we need to do? Because that's, at the end of the day, that's what we want to see, right? Correct, correct. You, you would want to... You would want to have a long-term vision and that vision set in reality and work towards that vision. So, the reality is there needs to be a good set of people sitting around that have a plan long term for, for the for the football and nation. Now whether that's possible or not, I don't know, but you, that's what you need because then it's going to take five years. So that 11 year old who becomes 16 is going to be a really good player at 16, but he's going to be even better five years later, which is 10 years from where your plan started. He's going to be 26. And then you'll have a bunch of those players and they're all around the world. But you've got to have that vision, you've got to have that planning, and you've got to set that in reality and work hard towards it. That's how a successful nation will have a successful football team. Let me ask you something. You started your career in 2015, right? Under yeah, Hakim Sharjah. It was around 2015, 2014. Yeah. First game against China in the World Cup qualifiers mm -hmm. in the first stages, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Then you also played in Arab Cup recently. Mm -hmm. So in that kind of timeline what did you notice changed or improved if anything or was it the exact same same problem same issues yeah that's one of the reasons why um, I don't see it changing I didn't see anything change in that time period some highs some lows but I didn't think, see anything changing it's strange I mean as somebody looking in from the outside I, you know you have new management in terms of like Adnan Dajjal, you have uh, improvements in terms of how the, the FA is set up with new faces. You didn't notice anything improved under the new administration? I mean, there's some people that have come on board and it became a little bit more professional from the outside, like Raif and those guys, but they, this is just a very short term stop and fix. The long term vision, the long term plan, it's never been there. So there should have been something in 20, in, if, I, if I made my debut in 2015, there should be kind of a plan for the time after. It's not, there's just week on week, month on month, year on year. So I guess it's the country a little bit in upheaval and what about the quality of players during that time? Like when you, when you started in 2015, 
you were in a squad with the likes of Ali Adnan, Hamad Barak, um, Ali Fahiz then. Oh, they were all quite still younger and everything. And then uh, a couple of months ago when you were in the Arab Cup, you were in a team that's completely different now. With the likes of Hassan Ra'id, Ahmed, Farlan, uh, Ahmed Farhan mm -hmm. and a few others. What did you make of that kind of that team versus that one? Has there been improvements? Has anything changed? Or is it just more of the same? It's kind of more of the same, and the truth is why it's more of the same uh, leads back to that culture issue. Is these youngsters, you, it's very hard to find a powerful youngster or a youngster that, re, that doesn't let things uh, affect him within a football pitch. After being surrounded by all this, you know, unplanning, no planning, uh, problematic uh, situ situations, you know, the bus doesn't turn up on time or trainings, it's changed day to day. It's very difficult to find that sort of player. And on top of that, the culture shows, hey, that you've got to respect your elders and they got egos. So the kid doesn't know or the player doesn't know exactly what to do and they don't thrive. So instead they just kind of survive and it's almost a feeling you only get when you're on the pitch, but you can see it. You can see it in a person's face. Who was the best player you ever played with for? I mean, there's different players of different types, different qualities. You know, Saad Abdelmir has that quality of just that calmness and and block, uh, and cutting out the the opposition attacks. Certain defense. There's so many. There's so many people that have that different qualities, but one or two did do shine because they don't. They actually managed with all that pressure to just go okay. Relax, relax the face, we're going to make this happen. Uh, but I don't think there's enough of those players. Who are these players that you're referring to? There's not many. Because the thing is, if I say a couple here, then I missed out a couple there. There's literally not many. Because otherwise, we still may have a chance of doing something. But there's not many. And those players can't get, aren't controlled. That's the issue. Those players, you can't control them because they have a certain... Um, atmosphere about them the way they walk the way they talk the way they are around the change room they're leaders you can't really control leaders so they people a little bit higher up don't really like to see those sort of people so that's unfortunate but there, there isn't money that's, we need more we need more leaders what about in terms of you like going forward What's your next step to success? You know, I've thought about this and I've put a plan in action and I'm really, really looking forward to the the decade that I think is probably going to be my greatest decade, which is my 30s. I'm 31 now and so I'm really looking forward to two things. I'm really looking forward to constructing this world that I spoke about. I realize you can't change people, so you can't change the world. But what you can do is you can construct a world where you have the right people around you and you have the right energy. And so I'm going to construct this world that's full of love, that's full of good people um, and just ambition and drive. And, and within that world, I'm going to do something that I haven't really done throughout my life and that's just be a little bit of a kid because you sacrifice so much of your time and energy to one thing which is football you forget to be a kid sometimes and so every now and again I might just stay up a little bit too late I might have that um, I don't know that slush thing that you have with too much sugar when you go to the cinema you know, meet a nice girl with good intentions and a good heart and go for a nice walk or something like that. You don't realize that you miss so much when you're growing up. You don't, you know, there's a girl that you like, can't really take her out. 
because you've got training the next day. Um, you miss out on quite a bit, school trips, mm. all of that. Hey, all I have to do is train and train and train and train and I want to be better and play. And as you go older, you've got to travel. And as you travel, you don't see the places you travel to. So I've been blessed to have traveled to so many countries, but I'd love to even visit countries that I've traveled to already and, and visit them a little bit more. And yeah, just while I'm doing that, be kind of a kid. Um, because yeah, I missed out. I missed out a little bit. But I think it's going to be great for me because while I construct this world and I'm mature and I'm being a man about it, I'm still doing the, these fun kiddie things and and I'm definitely going to mix that slush puppy together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you the know when you mix the two colours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the ones. So Yasser, with everything said and done, is there any final messages you want to say to the fans or anything you want to get off your chest? I want to say thank you. Thank you for the love. I really appreciate it and your kindness. Um, the little hugs. And the hi, how are you? It meant a lot to me. I hope that you saw a person or a young adult develop into a, a mature person who has shown kindness and love to you back. And I know I didn't get to win as much as I wanted to, but I think I think I won the hearts of the sort of common person and that's helped me as well on my journey because you've helped me build the heart that I've really wanted so thank you yeah so thank you so much for coming uh we wish you all the best and good luck with everything Habibi thank you for having me thank you appreciate it